All right, buddy, welcome back to Pack Talk Podcast, episode 75. And uh, today we're talking about remote collars. There's a lot going on in the world right now in relation to remote collars. They are uh, under attack, but they are a good training tool when used properly. And just like any training tool, they can be used properly. They can be used improperly. They can be referred to correctly. They can be referred to incorrectly. So today our goal is to go through um, the details of a remote collar, give all sides of the coin in relation to remote collars, try to provide education on them. And, uh, you know, again, the underlying premise is that, you know, they are a training tool. They should not be your only training tool, but uh, they can be used properly. They could be used improperly, just like a leash could be used properly. A leash could be used improperly. All right. All these kinds of things. We want to talk about what remote collars are and just like with anything you know terminology is very important and i think it's super important especially with remote collars and kennels actually because if they're spoken about or referred to in an improper way it's not going to help education and understanding of the equipment right versus if they're referred to the proper way all right so with that being said a kennel, for example, some people call a dog crate or a dog kennel. They call it a cage. I think that's improper because it's not a cage. You know what I'm saying? It's a simple management tool for us to use with our dogs. We should be making uh, comfortable associations with the kennel so that the dog likes it, so that it is a resting place. It's a safe place to go to. And uh, that's not something that a cage is, right? That's what a dog crate or a dog kennel is, okay? Um, Same thing with remote collars. Um, I refer to them as remote collars because that's what they are. Some people will refer to them as electronic collars, which while that's not 100% incorrect, I think there can be some negative connotations uh, with that terminology, electronic collar. I think that can scare some people or, again, if they hear that, they don't really understand how it operates, how it works. And then you have people that call them shock collars or zap collars, and these are 100% inaccurate because uh, remote collars, they do not shock, they do not zap. We will get into the details on how they work here shortly, Uh, but that terminology right there just, again, creates a negative mindset towards a training tool that could be very beneficial for both dogs and owners. You know what I'm saying? It can ensure safety for dogs and owners. It can provide freedom to dogs and owners, right? So referring to a remote collar as a a shock collar or a zap collar, 100% uh, improper use of terminology from my perspective. And, uh, you know, back in the day when remote collars first started out, sure, they were designed and built improperly, but the way that they are designed and manufactured today, um, you know, it's 100% safe to use, 100% not going to cause any uh, damage to a dog or a person, right? They operate like a TENS unit. We'll get into more details on that shortly. But uh, just interested if there's any other thoughts about terminology in regards to remote collars or any piece of equipment that you guys are thinking of right now. No, I mean, the way you said it, like the the words you use can paint a picture. You know what I'm saying? So like I think of uh, over in the UK, I know like they're trying to ban these things. You know what I mean? California too. Somebody comes up to you with a petition, hey, hey, you want to you wanna sign this to ban shock collars? And that's the terminology we're using. Let's say me as a person that doesn't know anything about this, just right off the rip, I'm not liking what these sound like. You know what I'm saying? Shock. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. That sounds horrible. Yeah, I'll sign this petition or whatever when really this is a valuable tool. So, like, just just using the wrong terminology for something paints a negative uh, light on it, right? Yeah. And when really calling it the right thing doesn't, right? Mm-hmm. It's a remote collar. It's all it is. It's a, it's a tool. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But. Well, uh, real quick, we'll talk about what does a remote collar actually provide to a dog owner. And I've already kind of briefly mentioned it, but a couple of things that popped to my head when I'm thinking about what does this tool provide to a dog owner when trained properly, when taught properly, when used properly is going to be freedom, right? Freedom to allow your dog to do things that dogs like to do, like running around being off leash, you know, chasing squirrels or whatever you want your dog to do, all those types of things. So your remote collar allows that freedom because it also provides safety. It also provides clear 
communication at a distance. You know what I'm saying? I typically refer to remote collars as invisible leashes because that's what they are. Why do we use a leash? To ensure the safety of our dog, to maintain some level of communication with our dog, to maintain control of our dog, right? So a remote collar, when used properly, when trained properly, is going to do those same things, right? It just gives you higher levels of communication, higher levels of freedom, higher levels of safety. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, let's say you've got your dog running around off leash. It starts going towards a road and your dog's not thinking about the road. They're a dog. You know what I'm saying? They don't know about cars and the danger that's there. They're just like running around having a good time chasing the smells that are in the wind. You know what I'm saying? And so they start going towards this road. You can, you know, tell your dog to come to you. Your dog is not going to 100% of the time uh, come to you when called, even if you've done everything you can to build up that command there's going to be things that are distracting your dog like this smell in the wind right your dog is uh not registering what you're saying so your remote collar allows you to back yourself up and give your dog a quick communication to turn around and head back towards you and also match their mindset because you can fine tune it to your dog's mindset and uh, communicate with them at that level at that time you know what i'm saying and then adjust from there so those are some of the benefits to using a remote collar I honestly think that, you know, 99% of dogs should be trained properly uh, in general, and that includes remote collar training and remote collar conditioning for that safety aspect, because I have not met a dog owner that does not want to have their dog off leash. At some point, they want to have their dog off leash, whether it's just in their yard, which guess what? There could be a snake in your yard. There could be a copperhead, right, or a rattlesnake, and you see it before your dog does. You can call your dog to you versus your dog going to uh, engage with that snake. You know, I've unfortunately seen videos of dogs going down towards a pond and the owner can see an alligator sitting right there. The dog, you know, they're telling their dog to come. The dog doesn't know what's going on. The dog's just hanging out by the water. Boom, gets grabbed by an alligator. You know what I'm saying? Like I've literally seen those things happen before. So a remote collar would provide that distance communication, that clear communication to ensure safety and allow freedom in all these situations. You know what I'm saying? So you guys have any other thoughts on what does a remote collar provide to a dog owner? Or you think I hit the nail on the head pretty good? I mean, you did pretty good. <laughs> you did a pretty good job. <laughs> to me, it's like it's it's insurance, right? In those situations, you need to be able to effectively communicate with your dog quickly. You know, it's pulling them out of danger or away from something that could be potentially dangerous, whatever the case may be. You sitting there and say, Fluffy, come here, boy. Come on, mm-hmm. go, go. Mm-hmm. They're not listening to you, right? Yeah. Everybody says, you know, that you meet with their dog. I know my dog. You do, but not 100%. Maybe 99.9%, right, because that's the way I am with my dog. No, I know what he's going to do, but I still account for that 0.1%. You know, that situation that's going to occur where I need the remote collar. And like I tell my clients, especially at this point in the relationship with my dog, I put the remote collar on every day, but I don't use it every day. Mm -hmm. I don't need to most of the time. Right. But if I do, I can. Right. You know, I could be walking with him. He could just decide, oh, I'm taking off running. I need to be able to get him back to me that second, not trying to, you know, negotiate with him and trying to do the recall. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. And uh, Lexi, you got something? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, you know, dogs are never going to be robots. They're never going to be machines. It's not going to be 100% perfection like you guys have both already mentioned. But it's like, you know, they're living, breathing beings. They're mammals. They have, you know, the freedom to make decisions just like we do. So, you know, just like we mess up, our dogs are going to mess up from time to time. They're going to get distracted by, you know, a smell in the pond, not notice the alligator from Mm -hmm. time to time. It's going to happen. You know, we can't make our dogs 100% perfect just like we're not. It's like we've already been talking about, you know, four you know, the mistakes that they might choose to make, you know, we have, you know, a proper accountability system to bring them back to us if it's an unsafe situation or just, you know, in regards to any environment that we're in with them. Yeah. I, I have clients too that'll say, well, hey, I'm never going to, I'm not going to do off leash, never going to take my dog off leash, you know? And it's like, what I tell them is you can't, you can't account for every scenario in life. You know, mm-hmm. you're walking in on the sidewalk, you hit a pothole, you trip, you fall, leash falls out of your hand. Your dog goes after a cat, mm-hmm. right? Leash slips out of your hand, right? Mm-hmm. There's, there's, there can be unlimited scenarios, you know, yep. like let's say, hey, you, we don't practice vehicle protocols and our dog, I open my car door, my dog jumps out. Now mm-hmm. I don't have the leash, yep. right? So now guess what? We're off leash. You know yep. what I'm saying? So like, again, it all comes back down to safety, having, having that safety net. Cause whether you do off leash work or not, I didn't do a lot of it with, with Vader when I'd go out and about, but mm-hmm. I knew I had that, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? I had the ability to recall him from anything, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And remote collar was a part of that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, 
going into you know a very important subject that people need to understand is how does a remote collar work you know because i think there's a lot of misunderstanding about how does this tool actually operate you know people think that it's going to cause damage to their dog which we've already said it's not going to cause damage to your dog right but the quick and easy way to understand how remote collar works is it works exactly like a tens unit does that's used in the medical field so if you've ever been to a physical therapist or a chiropractor or a doctor's office where you know they basically put these pads onto your your body right and then they put some electrical current through that and it stimulates your muscle right and a lot of times this can help with like muscle recovery or joint recovery because i believe i don't know the exact science of what it's doing but i'm pretty sure that it's like uh, stimulating your your blood flow through that tissue right so with that being said you know it's basically just running a, a current through your muscle that's going to stimulate the muscle right that's what's happening it's used on people all the time that is the exact same thing that a remote collar is doing right and uh, you can actually buy like a tens unit to use on yourself at home on Amazon. I have one, and uh, you know I've used it in the past. I haven't used it uh, free, uh, more recently, but basically it just has some pads. You plug it in. It looks like a old school uh, iPod. If anyone remembers the old school iPods, you know they're not around anymore. But like the iPod Nano was like this small iPod. You plug your headphones in. You're good to go. That's exactly the shape it is. You plug in the uh, contact pads you put them on where you need to uh, stimulate you turn it on you can increase the level decrease the level all that kind of stuff so same thing remote collar operates the same way which is why when you're placing a remote collar on a dog you want to make sure it's making contact with the muscle right um, so you want to place it on the dog's neck where there's a muscle for it to stimulate but with that being said that's kind of the quick and easy on how a remote collar works and uh, to answer the question you know, can it cause damage to a dog? The remote collar itself, the way it operates is not going to cause damage to your dog because of the way that it's, it's manufactured and made. The thing that can cause uh, skin tissue damage when we're talking about electrical current is amperage, right? And a remote collar does not get to the amperage level uh, where it can cause any type of skin issue at all, right? So you might see pictures online of people that are you know, trying to uh, push a certain agenda, they might show pictures of like, you know, rashes on dogs, you know, what they would call burn marks on dogs, right? Um, you know, like some kind of injury on the dog's neck. The remote collar itself, the way that it operates, cannot cause any damage. But what can cause damage or irritation to the dog's neck is improper fitment and improper usage of the remote collar. What that means is the remote collar has contact points on it that are going to make contact with that dog's skin. It has to make contact on two different parts, right? So most standard remote collars will come with standard contact points. And if someone is putting a remote collar on a dog improperly, they're not fitting it properly to the dog's neck, those contact points by themselves could cause irritation to the dog's neck because the person putting the remote collar on has put it on improperly. And this is separate from the stimulation of right. the tens. This is like literally the, the contact point. Right, is what's it's the causing. physical contact points. Right. Not the operation of the remote collar, but the physical contact points that could cause some type of irritation. And uh, typically it's gonna be if a remote collar is put on too tightly, right? Too tightly, that's gonna put constant pressure on the skin. And what that's gonna do is just deteriorate the skin over time, right? Or people will put the remote collar on too loosely. And what that does is as the dog's moving around, the remote collar is constantly, you know, pressing up against the skin, releasing against the skin, you know, brushing back and forth across the skin, right? So all this is gonna cause some type of irritation. And then the other thing that's gonna cause irritation is remote collars being on too long. You know, our general protocol, which I'll go through here in a little bit, is we're basically changing the positioning of the remote collar at least once a day you know what i'm saying if you're going to be using a remote collar for a full day we're changing the positioning at least once a day and then usually if we're not going to be home or if we're taking like a you know lunch break or something like that we'll take the remote collar off right and i'll explain more about why we do that later but again proper fitment is critical to reducing any type of irritation that could be caused by the physical contact points um, on the remote collar 
But again, the remote collar, uh, the way it works, the stimulation of the remote collar cannot cause any damage to skin, period, whether it be a dog or a human, okay? Now, with that being said, you know, technology is constantly evolving. So the, the remote collar manufacturer that we use, which we'll recommend later, they have a number of different contact point options so you can switch out your contact points based on your dog's skin and your dog's coat type, right? So you're not going to be using the same type of contact points for every single dog, which we'll go more into detail on here in a little bit, all right? But does anybody have any other feedback or comments on the, the rumor, the myth of a remote collar causing damage to a dog or proper fitment on a dog? I think another point to bring up is that whenever some people talk about causing damage with the remote collar, some people are like, oh, it's going to make my dog fearful or, oh, it's going to make them scared. It's going to make them, you know, insecure, things like that. So like if we're talking about that term, um, like that terms of damage and not the physical, psychological, yes, mental. psychological or mental damage, um, like that's kind of the same answer. Like it's like that remote collar, if it's taught properly, it's not going to, you mm -hmm. know, people are like, oh, it's going to make my dog fearful. No, it won't if we're teaching teaching them the correct way. If we just start, you know, putting it on and start using it, yes, you know, that can make a dog fearful depending on, you know, the dog personality type, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just claiming, making a blanket statement that a remote collar is going to make your dog fearful isn't exactly accurate either. It has to be taught properly. Right. Good point. Yeah. So like you said, and like we already talked about, they can be used properly. They can be used improperly, which we are going to detail how we teach a remote collar to a dog here in a minute but that psychological or mental side of the house too very important you know you got to go through a proper what we call conditioning process which is teaching that dog how to interpret the signal that the remote collar sends them right because remember a dog is a non-verbal being which means you can't talk to them like we are talking to you guys right now like you guys are listening to us you're either watching on youtube or you're listening to us through a podcast platform and you know, we can verbally give you information. We can't do that to a dog. We literally have to show you or show them physically information. So there is a step-by-step -step process to communicate to them about what this, what this feeling that you've never felt before, what it is and how to interpret it, right? And that's going to eliminate psychological or mental issues, you know what I'm saying? But if you use it improperly, you know, you might, you, you could have those kind of issues, you know what I'm saying? That's why we're at the point we are now. If the remote colors were only available to, say, like trainers who know how to condition them and they're good to go with it, we wouldn't be having mm -hmm. these issues. That's you a good know point. What I mean? uh, because they're widely available and people are buying them and it's 100%, usually 100% misuse. You know, they include a little booklet, hey, do this and this. Some of that is accurate, but it's not as thorough as it should be, mm -hmm. you know, especially to the average person who's trying to operate one of these things. Um, so that's where a lot of the problems are coming from, you mm -hmm. know, if it was some somehow kind of regulated. And that's another thing about red flags. I don't know if we talked about, but if you ask a, a potential dog trainer, you use remote collars, they're like, yeah, we put it on day one. You, know, you might want to kind of pull back from that because mm -hmm. it's basically what you would do. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get your dog to go through that. It needs to be introduced properly. So that's the yeah. thing. 100% misuse is the reason why they're getting banned in places because, um, you know, people are just cranking it, not knowing what they're doing, not understanding what they're doing. And mm -hmm. it's just or what they're looking for. Like, I know we're going to talk about the equipment, but like you can go on Amazon, get you a little $20 remote collar. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And people like we live in this day and age where you want quick, fast results and people will say, oh, my dog keeps running away. And what do the neighbors say? Yeah, get you, get you a good old shock collar. That'll, yeah, that'll yeah. fix your problems, right? And you, oh, I'll just go get this cheap thing. It's got seven levels on it, mm -hmm. right? Fitment's bad. Like, you, just like any tool, you need to do your research. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, invest in getting a professional to help you out, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least do a lot of research on your own, listening to podcasts like what we're doing here, watching our, some of our YouTube videos, things like that. Mm -hmm. But don't just put these things on yeah i mean every tool if improperly used will yeah. be effect, won't be effective or will you know create a bad scenario yeah. like i'm not going to use a, a pipe wrench to jack up a car right. you know what i mean right. so in every profession there are certain tools and they all just need to be used properly as we've mentioned yeah all right so now that we've got up to this point let's discuss real quick um how are we going to teach a remote collar to a dog and so before i delve into this topic i'm going to again i do it all the time refer the listener back to episode number 27, episode number 28. These two episodes are going to cover 
canine learning theory, how do dogs learn, how to understand how they learn, and also our training progression because, like Kevin just mentioned, you're not going to use a remote collar on day one. For us, we might start using a remote collar in general out of a four-week training program. We might start using it on day seven or day ten, somewhere around there, right? It's going to depend on the dog, depend on the situation that's going on. So it's not like you can just do what we're taught, what we're going to describe here out of nowhere, right? And that your dog understands that there are some prerequisites that need to be uh, provided to your dog. So first of all, your dog needs to know engagement. Your dog needs to have a relationship with you, right? And you can go back to episode 27, 28. We'll talk about that in those episodes. But you need to have engagement with your dog. You need to have a relationship with your dog. Then you need to be able to teach your dog uh, you know, through the use of, uh, rewards and reward markers, you need to teach your dog how to, uh, sit, how to heal, how to down, how to stay, how to come on command and how to, uh, spot, right? Those would be like the, the, the basic obedience commands you want your dog to know. And why is that important? Well, you need the relationship because you want your dog to pay attention to you. You want your dog to start having that mutual respect, mutual trust with you. The obedience is important is because through the obedience is how you're going to give your dog an understanding of the remote collar itself, right? So that obedience is critical. Uh, Remember, your dog is a nonverbal being, so that obedience is critical in helping to bridge the gap between a verbal species, which is a human, and a nonverbal species, which is a dog, okay? And then uh, you also need to teach your dog some form of accountability, which means if they disobey you, right, they know there's going to be some type of accountability. And what we do is we use leash corrections at first, right? We have a whole process for teaching that. But once the dog understands the engagement relationship, once the dog understands the basic obedience, once the dog understands accountability, now we're ready to start our remote collar conditioning process, okay? Now, the process starts off with the dog getting a remote collar that's properly uh, fitted to that dog and has the proper contact points for that dog, right? Which we'll talk more about that here in a minute. But you're going to select the remote collar that's properly fitted to your dog and has the proper uh, contact points for your dog. Then you're simply going to have your dog just wear that for at least 24 hours, preferably more than that. But the whole premise behind that is... The remote collar is another collar that your dog's wearing. That's a little bit tighter fitting than other collars, so it's going to take some time for your dog to get used to wearing it. And we basically want your dog desensitized to the fact that there's a new piece of equipment that it's getting used to, right? You have a protocol for putting it on. You have a protocol for taking it off. You have a routine and ritual for putting it on. You have a routine and ritual for taking it off. So you're getting your dog used to all that kind of stuff. And also... Like if you wear a watch or if you wear glasses or if you wear a hat, right? Something like that or a necklace or whatever you, whatever you wear every day, shoes, whatever. Um, you know, sometimes if you wear a watch, I guess I'm the only one with a watch. Yeah. Lexi? Lexi got a watch. Oh. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you wear a watch, right, and you wear it every day, if you take it off, Sometimes it feels like it's there and you're looking at your wrist and you're like, oh, shit, don't even have my watch on. You know what I'm saying? So, like, that happens and we want that sensation with the remote collar that it's just, you know, it's something that we always wear. Okay? So, once we achieve that, then we're actually ready to start the actual conditioning process. And the way this works is you're going to take your dog out to your normal training area with your normal training setup, your food rewards, your leash, your training collar, which we use first saver training collars, right? Whatever training collar you use, you're going to take your dog out to your normal training area. And then you're going to start at level one on your remote collar system. And you're going to just nick your dog, right? We'll talk about the features here in a little bit, but there's a stimulation setting called a nick, which is a one half second stimulation. You're going to nick your dog at level one and you're going to work your way up in levels until you can tell that your dog has registered the sensation. You don't want the sensation to be too much, but you don't want it to be too little. You want your dog to notice that there's some kind of sensation going on. And generally what your dog will do is like look to the side, look down towards the side where the uh, remote collar is at, right? They should just be hanging out with you, that kind of thing. As soon as you notice that there's some type of registration about the stimulation, then you're going to go into your conditioning process. And what we're doing is classically conditioning, 
the sensation of the remote collar, two different obedience commands. So the first one is the come command. And that's most important because if there's a dangerous situation and you need to communicate with your dog via remote collar when they're off leash at a distance away from you, we want default behavior to be to come back to you. Okay. So what we do is we provide a stimulation on the remote collar. We immediately say come. And then as soon as that dog turns in our direction and heads towards us, again, this is all on leash. We immediately mark with our terminal release marker, which is yes. We back up, we give a food reward. Okay, that's the basic process right there. And we do that repetitiously until we are comfortable that that dog understands that when they feel that stimulation, they should immediately move towards us. Once we do that with the come command, we're basically going to repeat that process for the sit command, the down command, and then uh, healing, right? Those are like the big ones. So we're going we're gonna to provide a little stimulation at a level they can barely register. Then we'll say sit, and then once they sit, we'll mark that, we'll reward them, right? And we do that for every obedience command. And again, the whole purpose is we want to classically condition the sensation of the stimulation to these different commands. Now, this might take one training session. It might take multiple training sessions. It might take multiple days. It depends on the dog. There's a lot of variables that can happen in this process. There's a lot of things that, uh, you know, could happen that a experienced professional dog trainer's advice or expertise might be needed to help figure out that individual dog or that individual scenario. You know what I'm saying? But if you're trying to do this yourself, if something feels weird or if you're not comfortable, you need to stop because you don't want to create any type of negative association, which you run the risk of if you're not knowing or just don't understand what your dog's telling you or what your dog's understanding at that time. Okay. So that's the basic process of how we're going to teach a remote collar to a dog. Once we get through that initial conditioning process, then what we're going to do is what we call remote collar application where we start applying the remote collar to every area of life day in and day out. And what we're doing is classically, classically conditioning the remote collar to equal the leash. So anytime we would ever need to signal the dog with the leash, we would simply put a uh, quick remote collar sensation or stimulation in front of that leash communication. So let's say I was walking with my dog and my dog started pulling on the leash, right? Up to this point, or we've trained our dog not to do that, but let's say they decide to do that. We say no, which means they've done the wrong thing. We provide a quick stimulation on the remote collar. Then we follow up right after that with our traditional, typical leash correction, our leash accountability. And what that's going to do is classically condition the remote collar to equal the leash. Therefore, in the future, as we repetition this out, it's going to replace the leash in the long term and give us that invisible leash communication. All right. So that is the general overview of how we're going to teach a remote collar to a dog. We have our desensitization of wearing the remote collar. We have our conditioning process itself where we provide stimulation classically conditioned to each obedience command starting with the come command. And then we have our application phase where we then classically condition the remote collar to equal the leash in the dog's mind. So what do you guys have thoughts on that? I mean, what, we've mentioned this probably in all of our training episodes on the podcast, but don't rush the process, right? And so, like, I can't stress enough the importance of having that obedience done to a very high standard. The dog has to understand what you are asking them to do, right? Because mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you start you start introducing this unfamiliar stimulus. They don't know what to do, right? So now, now you can have a negative experience, and now that's where you're going to get a lot of these uh, misuse scenarios with, and, and other trainers are unfortunately doing it that way as well. Right. But when the dog knows what to do, it's a very fair process for the dog and it's a good tool to use, but don't rush the process that obedience. You want that very well understood by the dog. We got to take a quick break and, uh, Kevin had to step away to take care of some stuff, but we are still here. So with that being said, continuing on, we've already discussed a lot of information in regards to remote collars. We just finished uh, discussing remote collar conditioning, desensitization, remote collar application, right? All very important subjects. The most important piece of remote collars using them is this desensitization conditioning application process. And again, if you're trying this at home, which I strongly urge you to 
get the advice and expertise of a professional dog trainer when you're doing this process. But if you're trying to do this at home, you know, if there's anything that seems out of the ordinary, anything that seems abnormal, you know, stop what you're doing immediately, seek expertise from a professional dog trainer. Um, because again, you don't want any type of negative association, because if you do create a negative association, there's going to be a long road ahead to kind of counter condition that and get everything good to go. All right. So with that being said, how do we use a remote collar in our day to day life? Once we've gotten through the application phase of the conditioning process, you know, for me personally and all the clients that we train, you know, we keep it pretty simple, right? So what we recommend is that putting the remote collar on first thing in the morning, don't take your dog off leash unless you have a remote collar on. So if you're taking your dog to go potty first thing in the morning, take him out there on a leash, put the remote collar on, feed him breakfast, and then do like your morning exercise, morning routine, right? And after you put your remote collar on, the reason why we put it on before breakfast is because for us, we put our dogs in the kennel when we're feeding them breakfast, or we have some type of structure around our breakfast time, which includes eating and then a small rest period right after that. So that's going to be like 10 to 30 minutes long, which we put the remote collar on right before that process. Then we do the feeding routine and that allows us to remain desensitized to the remote collar with the dog because what happens is if you put the remote collar on then you immediately start using it you run the risk of there being sensitization to the remote collar and what will happen is the dog will become collar wise and they will know when the collar's on they will know when it's off they'll do things they're supposed to be doing when it's on then they'll start disobeying when it's off right so we want to alleviate that we want the dog to be well-rounded, so we put it on, we feed them, then we do our morning exercise, morning training, whatever you're going to do, and then if you're going to be home all day, I would leave it on at all times when you're home. Halfway through the day, maybe around lunchtime, I would switch the positioning of the remote collar on the neck to minimize any type of skin irritation from the contact points. So in general, we'll put it on the left side of the neck in the morning, right side of the neck in the afternoon. That's generally what we do. And then uh, in the evening, you know, whenever you do your last go out to go potty time in the night, take it off after that. Okay. That's kind of the quick and easy of how we're going to use that every single day, at least putting it on, taking it off. Now, with that being said, if you work, let's say you work nine to five in an office, your dog's at home, take it off while you're at work, put it back on when you get home. You know, if you're going to be out shopping for a couple hours in the afternoon or go out for lunch and leaving your dog at home for a couple hours, take it off. Put it back on when you get home. The reason for that is we're just one, wanting to minimize any type of skin irritation. And if I'm not going to be home, not going to be using it, I'll just have it off anyway. Now, there are some times when I'm gone for maybe an hour, I'll just leave it on, right? But if I'm going to be gone for multiple hours, I'm probably going to take it off, okay? So in general, that's how we're putting it on and taking it off throughout the day. And then if I ever need to communicate with my dog, I'm just going to use the remote collar, right? So again, going back to that example, my dog's off leash hanging out they're moving away from me maybe it's something dangerous they're moving towards if i say come and they do not come i just say no and i provide a uh, stimulation via remote collar okay that's what i do in that case um, so in in general if they're disobeying me or out of position or doing something they're not supposed to be doing like maybe they're trying to counter surf maybe they're trying to get in your trash you know these types of things then you can say no you know, communicate with the remote collar. And then if your dog is confused on what to do, like let's say uh, your dog's digging in the trash, you say no, you give them a stimulation on the remote collar, they stop digging in the trash. Maybe they don't know what to do after that. Then you'll just redirect them into something that they should be doing, which maybe that could be a downstay. Maybe it could be coming to you. Maybe it could be going to their spot or their place command, you know, things like that. Okay. So that's in general how we're going to use a remote collar during the day. If you guys have any other feedback on that one um, on the note you mentioned the like a dog becoming collar wise one of the other things that i'll see a lot of our clients fall into whether it's whether it's a psychological like what we talked about earlier they have that negative connotation towards it sometimes we'll we'll only use it in certain contexts right like hey i mm. only use it on my walks because that's where i need it that's a that's a good way to get your dog collar wise mm -hmm. to where they're going to figure it out and then you're going to have trouble in the in the home and things like that so yeah. Yeah, that's why you follow all these. Just just use your remote call even when you're if you're home. Yeah. All right, good to go. 
Um, and then another question I get all the time is, will you have to use your remote collar your whole life? Will you have to use the remote collar your whole life? And in general, what I see is that, you know, let's say you're working on training your dog, or maybe you're transitioning your dog back home from training. There's a lot of testing going on. They're testing the boundaries. If you can be consistent and effective with your communication with your boundaries, you know, you might have to use a remote collar or any type of correction pretty consistently for a while. But as soon as your dog understands that you're holding the line with your consistent expectations, you won't have to use it that much. There are going to be times where your dog's distracted and you will need to use it, right? So that's why you need to keep it on every single day, even if you're not having to use it. It's still a piece of equipment. It just goes on your dog, just like uh, you put your watch on your wrist every day, just like you take your keys with you out to your car, right? Just like you uh, have like a tire jack in your car. Maybe you always have a water bottle with you or something like that. Whatever you normally have with you every day, even if you're not necessarily using it every day, you know, it's just good to have with you. So will you have to use it your whole life? You know, that depends. There may be times when you need it, when you don't need it, but I always have mine ready to go. I always follow my daily routine and ritual. It goes on in the morning. It comes off in the evening. I rotate it halfway through the day. You know, that should be kind of the standard uh, throughout the life of the dog. Now, if your dog gets like older and not really moving around that much, and you know, in that case, you might not need to use it. You might not need to put it on anymore because your dog's, you know, reaching the end of its life, unfortunately, and it's not really just having a lot of energy to do different things. So in that case, maybe you don't need to put it on. But, you know, in most cases throughout the life of your dog, I would just leave it on because uh, you never know what could happen. You know, you never know when your door could accidentally just open up your dog waltz out to the street. You know, you never know when so-and-so might show up, open your door, or you're having people come over randomly or whatever. You never know what's going to happen, and you just want to be able to have that effective communication, that safety net always there for whatever's going on. What else you guys got on that? That's I, a common question. It is. I think I look, in my opinion, I usually, I, I've, I just have to look at the person that's asking that question. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, like, why are you asking that question? Most likely because there's there's still some type of attachment towards the remote collar system and, and like the, the or a negative negative the, mindset right towards exactly it. Like right. the underlying question is can i move away from using this tool because i don't like this tool mm. right and so like you have to kind of look at why are we, why are we asking this question because it could be you have the wrong perspective still at that point so now it's more of an education thing so it's like i don't know you're if you're putting a putting shingles up on a house. I'm not a roofer, so don't, just just using an analogy. Here we but, go. <laughs> you know, if I got a hammer and nails, I can do that. I can do it effectively. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna take me a long time. Got a nail gun. It's gonna be a little bit more effective. So it's literally a tool. You know what I'm saying? Like it's nothing. Like don't don't look into it deeper. Like oh my gosh, I'm gonna I'll just correct on the leash and not the remote color because it's worse. You know, like mm -hmm. don't don't assign those labels to it because that's not what it is. If you're doing everything we've talked about. It's an effective tool. It's going to make life easier. It's going to make life safer for your dogs. Mm -hmm. There's so many scenarios where dogs have died, you know, that, that, that are close to us, people we know. You know what I'm saying? Dogs have died that literally having this tool in place could have saved their life. You know right. what I'm saying? So, like, it's literally just a tool. Don't have this, you know, negative perspective towards it. Educate yourself. But, like, yes, you can. Like, at the end of the day, like, there's times I'll let my dog out. I don't have a fenced-in property, and I'll let them out without a remote collar. And they recall, and it's fine. But in general, I'm using my tools. Yep. Most of the time, consistently, I'm using my tools. But, yes, my dogs will still listen without this collar. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Because I use it consistently. And uh, one point that you brought up, you know, about it can save certain situations, you know? Like, if you watch some of the videos that we've reviewed, the React videos where you have, like, uh, dogs fighting. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? What you can do in that case is uh, if you have clear communication established, you can easily communicate to your dog to move away from that situation, call your dog out of that situation. You can stop that situation without having to physically get involved because if you get in, in the, into the mix with a couple dogs fighting, for example, guess what? There could be some damage that you incur. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because of that. So just something to pay attention now, to Now again. As well. Go, comes back to that foundation, right? So, like, don't think in that scenario, two dogs fighting, oh, I'm just going to put a remote collar on. You may make that dog fight w harder or come at you or read, like, there's mm -hmm. going to be all these other issues. So, again, even in that scenario, like, this is why it's important to do this conditioning process. Even if I provide stimulation in a, in a scenario where my dog's fighting, he has to know what to do, mm -hmm. right? It's like, when I give a recall, he knows what to do, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, exactly. Keep that in mind.
All right, last but not least, let's discuss remote collar recommendations. So the manufacturer of remote collars that we use is Dogtra, right? You can uh, get their collars on Amazon. You can get their collars uh, on their website. But uh, there's, there's kind of like some common remote collar systems that we use from them. We basically use the Dogtra 280C. That is currently like our standard collar. Most dogs will use, start off with that collar. And uh, the reason why we have different models that we're using is because we always want to use the smallest, lightest collar possible right on the dog's neck and then secondly uh we you know cost effective budget wise the smaller the collar the cheaper it's cheaper it's going to be budget friendly for the user so with that being said dogtra 280c is kind of our go-to the step up from that is the dogtra arc right which would be a step above the 280c the 280c has a two dog system so yeah if you have two dogs and you want them on the same remote you can get a 282c if you have an arc and you want uh, to run two dogs on that remote collar, you can get a uh, arc with a secondary collar. Then they have the 1900, which is kind of the what we call the big boy collar for more tolerant dogs or dogs that, you know, are very tolerant of uh, corrections, right? Some dogs are like that, just like people. So the 1900S is kind of the big boy collar, and uh, that also has a two dog system as well. So if you're running one dog or two dogs on your remote collar, you know, those are generally the main collar systems that we use, but they do have other ones as well, like the Pathfinder, which has like GPS on it. And then uh, they don't make this one anymore, unfortunately, but the Dogtra IQ Mini would be for super tiny dogs. Like think about a Chihuahua or a, uh, just like a smaller Yorkie. Yorkie, right? They, they, you can still find these on Amazon, which we've been trying to buy them up. Get but, them while uh, they're hot. Yeah. Get them before they go out of production. But uh, we're trying to have some conversations about why they're stopping that. <laughs> but <laughs> come on but anyway so you got the 280c you got the uh, arc you got the 1900 those are the main ones and then for the contact points all of these collar systems they come with what we call standard contact points which are about a half inch long right so what we do is we have three other contact points that we generally will use they have a regular and a large size wing adapter and the wing adapter is super useful for uh, dogs with uh, you know kind of weird symmetry to their neck because what the wings do is they kind of reach out a little bit and then they flex a little bit so they naturally want to flex towards the dog's neck and also this can minimize any type of irritation to the dog's neck because as the neck is moving as the dog's moving these wings will flex to the dog's neck to keep the contact points just snugly up against the skin right so the wing adapter is perfect for dogs with like irregularly shaped necks or super thick fur, super long hair, things like that, um, because it makes good contact. And for me personally, in general, with uh, the training dogs, I've been using wing adapters more so than the standard contact points, just because I like the way they flex. They provide that constant contact, and I really don't have any contact issues uh, with the contact points that I might have had with the standard contact points. So they have the large and regular versions of that. Then they have what's called a comfort pad, which is a super small and uh, minimalist pad that's very smooth. And th this would be for like thin haired dogs or short haired dogs like a pit bull or a Doberman, dogs like that, German short haired pointer, you know, those types of dogs. Uh, because it's smooth, it just sits up against the skin. It makes good contact without any risk of irritation to the dog's neck. So these additional contact points are uh, important for minimizing any type of risk to the dog's skin any type of risk of uh, irritation because again the remote collar itself the way it operates will not cause any irritation to the dog but the contact points failure to have good fitment is the number one reason why there might be some type of irritation caused to the dog's neck so those are kind of the general remote collar recommendations that we have you guys have any other feedback on those I mean, this is where I think I think getting getting some help from a professional trainer is going to be beneficial, right? Because you don't know what system. Like, if you're whether whether you're doing like a, a board and train program like like us, we we'll, we will find the right system for your dog. Hopefully, if you're doing like a private lesson kind of scenario, that trainer will have access to multiple systems because uh, you don't want to go spend a couple hundred bucks on let's say the 1900, you know, when it had the output's going to be too much for your dog, or you don't want to get a lower collar that has too low of an output. Now, oh, now I got to upgrade, right? So like you could end up spending a lot of money here, but this is where it will be beneficial to kind of have a professional help you out to, to select the proper system for your dog. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, 
you know, with that being said, sometimes you might initially get one remote collar system for a dog, then you figure out you might need to get a different one, right? So having the expertise of a professional dog trainer can help you get on the right path for that, make good recommendations for you, adjust as needed. And uh, one thing Kevin mentioned before he had to roll out was red flags, you know? So if you're trying to communicate with some dog trainers that are local to you, for example, and, uh, you know, maybe they're saying, they're going to use remote collars on day one, or maybe they're trying to have you come in for a consultation and they want to go ahead and put a remote collar on your dog. All these are red flags. Remember, there are prerequisites to remote collar training. And again, engagement, relationship, obedience, and then the dog understanding some type of accountability, generally going to be through the leash before you even start the remote collar, is critical to long-term success. You know what I'm saying? So if anyone's trying to skip those steps, red flag goes up, I'm not meeting with him. I'm not working with him anymore. I'm going to find somebody else. And we did do a podcast on how to select a proper uh, professional dog trainer. I don't remember the 45, somewhere around episode 45. And so uh, if you refer back to that episode, we go into detail on some questions to ask, some things to think about when you're trying to select a professional dog trainer uh, to get some ex expert help from. You know what I'm saying? So uh, anyway, with that being said, any closing thoughts on remote collars? No, I mean, it's a good, it's a great tool. And I can, t I'll say from, like, I was one of those people. I wouldn't say that I was like avidly against remote collars, but I was definitely apprehensive to remote collars because I had a lack of understanding. I think so most I, people are. I think, I think that's the general, uh, <coughs> that's generally what you see. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, I don't, I don't really understand this tool. They, they already have this this negative connotation, people are calling them, you know, the wrong terms and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So it's like, uh, I don't know if I want to use this on my dog. So I was definitely in that camp, you know, and uh, as, as Chad educated me and showed this to me, I used it on myself. That was the first thing I said, Hey, I'm putting this on myself, you know, and, and most of the time, and I have all my clients do that. Most of the time you go, Oh, okay. That's mm -hmm. a, just a 10 unit. It's not that, not that, not that bad. Yeah. Right. So like, but I have now seen firsthand the uh, the benefit to having a remote, remote collar, oh, yeah. literally as, as much as saving live, saving our dogs lives. You Absolutely. Know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, definitely pro remote collar. Well, you know, one of my dog, I like to let my dogs do what they like to do, right. you know, within reason, right. With the way my structure is set up, the way I do things. And one of my dogs just loves running through the woods, <laughs> smelling things, chasing things. And I want her to be able to do that. Her name is Georgia. She's a Doberman, but she'll literally be out running around the woods for, hours all you know what i'm saying all day <laughs> she loves chasing squirrels smelling things running around like that makes her feel good she likes doing that i like it uh that she has the ability to do that and uh you know when it's time to go in the house at the end of the day and just call her back and if she's not coming back i can easily communicate to her with the remote collar at a distance you know and uh then she's coming back and we're just going about our our routine after that it's no big deal it's very clear concise communication you know there have been times where I've been hiking with my dogs in Georgia. Again, she, if there's something in the woods, she will find it, you know, and she's found snakes before. And I'm like, I don't know what kind of snake that is because it's too far away from mm -hmm. me. So I call her back and she's ready to kill this thing. And so I have to use my remote collar to communicate to her like, hey, get back from that thing until I can identify what it is. And because uh, I don't want her getting a snake bite, you know, what I'm saying at least a venomous one. And so, again, that has saved lives in that scenario. You know, or maybe you have a dog that you're hiking or walking with and maybe there's uh, some old food on the ground someone left in your neighborhood or maybe there's roadkill in your neighborhood. Your dog's trying to eat it. You know, you don't want an upset stomach. You don't want to deal with diarrhea later. So you can communicate to your dog to come away from that. And if they're not coming away from that, you can use your remote collar communication to back yourself up and ensure their safety. You know, so just some examples, you know, other examples that I talk to people about are like they're on the beach. They're hanging out with their dog on the beach. The dog's running around playing, having a good time. And uh, maybe their dog's trying to drink salt water. You know, that's going to cause diarrhea, 100%. That's going to cause, like, throw up in your car. You know what I'm saying? So stopping that, your remote collar can help with that. Your remote collar can ensure your dog's safety on the beach, calling them back to you. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, again, the, the uses are endless. It provides that freedom. It provides that safety. It provides that clear, concise communication when used properly, right? When trained properly. So again, you know, you might need to listen to this podcast a couple times to understand it and, uh, you know, ensure that you're making the right choice when you're using a remote collar. But be wary of 
uh, trainers out there that are trying to push it on you in a negative way. It's a training tool. It should be incorporated into your overall training progression, training pipeline, and it shouldn't be, uh, you know, too quickly incorporated, right? It's got to be done properly with the proper prerequisites to training. Okay. So with that being said, Pack Talk Podcast is sponsored by Canine Revolution Dog Training. So if you guys need dog training, if you're local to the South Carolina area, like the South Carolina Low Country, you know, you can reach out to us on our website. You can call us, you can text us, you can email us, whatever's most convenient for you. We'll be more than happy to help you. We're more than happy to do a consultation. And there have been consultations where we've done, where we've gone over to the people's house. We've given them, uh, you know, education. We've given them uh, training. And they've been able to accomplish their goals themselves. They don't need us. That's good to go. We've also had people that have signed up for training. We've sent them a bunch of our YouTube content. And they've uh, done the training themselves on YouTube. They didn't need us. Good to go. We're happy to help. We're happy to educate. Um, But even if you're across the United States, we've trained dogs from all over. We've trained dogs from Florida, Georgia, California, Washington State, Texas, right? All over the place. Uh, You know, Connecticut, Massachusetts. So if you have a dog and you want it to come through Canine Revolution Dog Training or you want to work with us, reach out to us. We will coordinate that with you guys. Also, the podcast is sponsored by Canine Revolution Apparel. So if you're a dog owner and you like dog stuff and you like Canine Revolution, you can hop onto Amazon. You can grab you a Canine Revolution Apparel t-shirt. You can grab you a good-to-go hoodie, a good-to-go shirt, and you'll be good to go, right? Also, it's tank top season. Mm. We got the Iron Revolution tank top. Because we got to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our dog. And the Iron Revolution mentality is hey, we got to get healthy. We got to get fit. And the more healthy and fit we are, the more capable we are of taking care of ourselves and taking care of our dogs and just getting after it in general, right? So jump onto Amazon, grab you some Canine Revolution apparel. That's going to support the podcast. Last but not least, make sure you're supporting America. You know, there's some things going on in the world. If you're not paying attention, there's some things going on. And uh, also, there's some slave labor being used, right? Countries across the, across the ocean from America using slave labor. We don't want to support that. So what are we doing? We're supporting ourselves. We're supporting America. And that's why we support Jocko Fuel and Origin USA. Jocko Fuel, they have good supplements that are good for you, that are going to help you. No fillers, no bad ingredients, right? And then Origin USA has, uh, you know, jeans, boots, belts, jujitsu geese, hats, hoodies, all this kind of stuff. Underwear. Underwear. I have some. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, you touched it. I did. When it was on me. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so it's all of the products made at Jocko Fuel and Origin USA. The products are sourced in America. Every ingredient, every piece of those jeans, the cotton, it's from America. It's made in America by Americans, by Americans. And uh, anyway, (laughs) so if you want to support America, you want to support manufacturing in America, go to jockofuel.com, originusa.com. You can use the discount code SINGER101. That'll get you 10% off. And I was having a debate with someone recently. They were saying, man, those Jocko Go Energy drinks, it's like $2.70 a can. And I was like, well, how much is a monster in the gas station? $2.79, $2.90, whatever, how much is a Red Bull? Same thing. So, you know, don't let propaganda try to get you away from good things that are good for you, sourced and made in America, right? You can go on the website, you can use a discount code, 10% off, now you're saving money. You know what I'm saying? And you're supporting yourself. (laughs) And it's good. Good for you. All right, we're good to go. So, all right, you guys got any other closing thoughts? Good to go. Chris, you got... You got the Jocko jeans. I got the I got the Delta sixty eight and the uh, factory denim. Both. What uh what Jocko fuel supplements are you on right now? Go. You're on the Go, uh, which is War. the energy drink. Cold War. You feel a little sick. Yeah. You slam that Cold War. Good to go. I good take that if I'm feeling sick. I don't yeah. take it like every day, but or during pollen season, like right now, it's pollen season. So I've been taking or my like Cold War. Or like when you travel, you know. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know, my wife had me go on vacation last month. <laughs> Brought some Cold War. Good to go. <laughs> You taking greens? Taking greens, you're milk, on the greens. Milk. protein, protein. Good to go. I'm on the. I'm so on you're the on the train. train. You're on the train. You're good to go. All right, cool. Well, anybody got anything else? Lexi, you're good. Good to go. All right, Ben, you're good. All right, 
we we'll appreciate the listener. Thank you guys for listening. If you guys want to, you can uh, rate the podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. We like all comments. All of them. If you want some entertainment, you can go to our Facebook or our TikTok and read some comments. Those are good. We got that'll some haters. Get, that'll get you going. We got some haters. <laughs> so anyway, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you all next time. This is Pack Talk Podcast. Out.